On the track where super speedway stock car racing was born, the Southern 500 is now one of the pivotal events on a multi-million dollar racing tour. This year, it helps to determine whether longtime star Cale Yarborough or newcomer Dale Earnhardt will win the tightest battle ever for the Grand National Championship. But both will be on the lookout for the Silver Fox, David Pearson, who has made a habit of winning big races on the legendary Darlington Raceway, the tightest and slipperiest of all super speedways. Darlington, you'll be there today for the Southern 500. You're looking at 41 cars lined up on the front straightaway of the Darlington Raceway in Darlington, South Carolina for the start of the Southern 500 stock car race. This moment, the climax of a five-day buildup and excitement through qualifying, practice runs, preliminary racing before a crowd of more than 70,000 people, many of whom have been here in the infield or outside the track throughout the weekend. Like so many big stock car races, not only a great sports event, but also a memorable party. Hello, I'm Jim Lampley. The Southern 500 is one of the most important and prestigious races on the Grand National Stock Car Racing Circuit for a couple of reasons. One, if you were to throw a 200-mile net over this place, Darlington, South Carolina, you would cover almost all of the small southern towns where most of these drivers were born and raised. Two, the very first Southern 500, 30 years ago on this track, was in a sense the birth of big-time super speedway stock car racing. So this racetrack is in many ways the emotional center of the sport. It's also perhaps the most slippery and dangerous of all the big-time super speedways. That makes racing here very interesting. And man who can tell us more about that is the versatile race car driver and motorsports expert, Sam Posey. Sam, for the speed at which they travel, it's a relatively accident-free form of racing. And yet, almost all of the big-name drivers can point to a crash at some point in their careers here at Darlington. Why so? Well, the reason for this, Jim, is, as you said, the track was built 30 years ago. Back then, speeds were slower. You could almost run this thing flat out. Now, today, you can run Daytona, Talladega, flat out, as you used to be able to here. That leaves a driver his chance to look around at the other cars. He can, he can concentrate on where they are placed. But here at, at Darlington, what's happened is the speeds have gotten so high compared to what you can run the track at that you now have to brake and back off of the turn. You have to drive the track as well as trying to position yourself in traffic. The result, very, very tough racing. And a lot of pressure on the drivers. And our man among the drivers is the man who appears on the left in this photograph taken just 27 years ago. He's the editor of National Speed Sport News, motor racing expert and Bermuda shorts aficionado, Chris Economaki. And he's in the pits just as he was then. So let's go to him. It was a long time ago, that first Southern 500. 75 cars started. They were American passenger cars in every sense of the word. Radios, heaters, windshield wipers, and headlights. And when it was all over, 50 of the 75 cars had finished, and winner Johnny Mance had required over six and a half hours for the race. He averaged 76 miles an hour. They qualified twice as fast as that now. And it was close and hot that day, as it's close and hot today. And everything over the years at Darlington seems to be close. The racing on the track is extremely close, and the point battle is as close as it is in history. Right now, Dale Earnhardt leads, and Cale Yarbrough is gaining. He's 23 points behind. And if this race is over today and Cale Yarbrough should finish ahead of Dale Earnhardt by about four or five positions, he'll take the lead for another national championship. Back to you, Jim. Now as the cars are on the track and in the pace lap, let's very quickly set the field. In the first row, the pole sitter is car number 88, Darrell Waltrip. Outside of him, number 11, Cale Yarborough from just down the road. In the second row, two outstanding veterans, number 27, Benny Parsons, number 28, Buddy Baker. In the third row, Neil Bonnet, number 21, one of the outstanding young drivers in the sport. Outside of him, number one, David Pearson, who's won more races on this track than any other man. Fourth row is number 12, Donnie Allison. Number two, points leader, Dale Earnhardt. Fifth row, number 47, Harry Gant. Number 44, Terry Labonte. Sixth row, Bill Elliott, number nine. Second in this race a year ago, 15, Bobby Allison. And back in the eighth row, in an unaccustomed position for him, is number 43, the king of the sport, Richard Petty, driving with a neck injury that he sustained a month ago at this crash at the Pocono Raceway in Pennsylvania. Jim? Richard was going into the second turn at Pocono, but right there, he lost his right front wheel and helplessly careened right there into the wall. But at this point in the crash, the damage was all on the right side of the car. Richard was still fine inside. There's Buddy Baker going by in front of you. Now watch this. Chuck Bone appears spinning backwards. He gets by Richard. Now, here comes Darrell Waltrip for the hit. Waltrip, at that point, right into Petty's door. That's when Richard was injured in that crash, right at that point. 
Richard Petty coming back from that neck injury sustained in the Pocono 500. Now we're very close to the start of the race. Let's go to NASCAR race control to see if they get a green flag. Looking good. That's the deal we had with him. Green flag, green flag. So the race has officially begun, and here they come. Coming off the line for the lead, it is Darrell Waltrip. And moving up into second place behind him, Benny Parsons. Cale Yarbrough got an extremely slow start off the front of that pack. I think he may have missed the upshift, Jim. They start in third gear and make a quick upshift into fourth. I think that's where he had his problem. There are the leaders as they go down the back straight away, and as they go into turn three, it is Darrell Waltrip in car number 88, the green and white car, in the lead. Behind him in second place, Benny Parsons, who came from the second row. And in third place, Neil Bonnet, who came from all the way back in the third row. Cale Yarbrough has dropped well back in the pack. But Darrell Waltrip is out in front in leading on this difficult track. Earlier, we asked him about the importance of gaining the pole position here. It's one of the most, uh, it's the first strategical move, really, uh, to start up front and avoid any uh, mishaps early is, is very important. Uh, the pole car, the front row cars, usually, uh, if there's any trouble on the racetrack, usually can avoid it. It's usually in the back, back in the pack with guys banging in each other, maybe getting into turns early and uh, not enough racing room and the groove hadn't moved up enough and there's wrecks. So uh, starting up front is uh, the first really important move of the week. Right now, Waltrip's strategy is working. He's still out in front. The pool champion's trick shot wizardry, originally scheduled to be shown today on Wide World, will not be seen in order that we can bring you up to date on a story involving Beth Hyde, which you'll see in just a little while. Oh, Jim, there's David Pearson. He was the winner of the race here this spring, but he's in trouble early on here. I have no idea at this point what's wrong with it, but he seems to be headed to the pit. Pulling his car around on the apron past turn four and toward the pits. We'll follow that story as it develops. Back out on the track, the leader is still Waltrip in the green and white car. Behind him, Benny Parsons, Neil Bonnet in third place. All three of those cars were from the inside of the starting grid. They shot out in a straight line, but now Cale Yarbrough, who had that trouble at the start of the race, has moved back up into fourth place. And there is David Pearson's car in the pit. They appear to be working around the right front quarter panel. We'll follow that story when we come back. Back at the Darlington Raceway, still early in the Southern 500 stock car race. The leader still car number 88, Darrell Waltrip, car number 27, Benny Parsons chasing him in second place. Earlier, you saw David Pearson in the pits. He is back on the track and racing now, those two laps behind the leaders. For more on that, let's go down to Chris Economaki. David Pearson got into the wall with that red number one car, and he had to stop in the pit to have the sheet metal pulled out on the right side. Now, the crew says the suspension is okay, and maybe it is, but if it isn't, Darlington's biggest winner may have an uphill grind today. Back to you, Jim. He's already got an uphill climb, two laps behind this man, Darrell Waltrip, but two laps is by no means an insurmountable obstacle in a 500-mile stock car race. Especially for David Pearson, Jim, who is a master of using all the racetrack here. And oh, look at that! Cale Yarbrough is in some kind of trouble. Flames from under car number 11, Cale Yarbrough. He pulls around turn number two and down onto the apron. And let's hope Cale gets out of the car in a hurry. There he goes. <laughs> look at that. The car hadn't even stopped. Might be some kind of an oil fire up under the engine there. It's hard to say. So that seems to have knocked Cale Yarbrough out of the race. If not for good, then certainly for quite some time. You see the consternation on the face of crew chief Junior Johnson, who manages Kale's car. And where are the fire guys, you wonder? Where, where are they? There oh, they are, they at long last. Okay. Yarbrough had been running in eighth place when this happened. Now they're not doing anything to put out the fire, and Kale has to take charge of that situation. Well, this is an awfully leisurely approach, Jim, to putting out a fire in a car that costs about 60,000 bucks. Look at that right front fender there. He must have been into the wall just before the fire. So they'll be under the caution flag here at Darlington, and that gives us an opportunity to go back to a week ago when American speed skating star Beth Hyden won a world championship in another sport. We'll be back later. We're back at Darlington Raceway where the green flag is about to drop for more racing. During the caution flag, all of the leaders have taken pit stops. There's been some shuffling about. We'll try to straighten them out for you as they come down the front straight and take the green flag. The car on the left at the front of the pack, the blue and white car, Benny Parsons is the leader at this moment. The car next to him, the red car, David Pearson, is the man you saw earlier in the pits. He is still two laps behind the leaders, but has used the caution flag well to get to the front of the pack. Now, as they go down the back straight, you see number 88, 
Darrell Waltrip going past 44, Terry Levante, and 27, Benny Parsons, back into the lead. So Waltrip, using his speed to take the lead, he had held it through most of the early portions of the race, is once again in the front of the pack. Second place, Benny Parsons. Third place, number 44, second-year racer, Terry Labonte. And just behind Labonte, Buddy Baker, car number 28, is now in fourth place. Darrell Waltrip, clearly at this point, the fastest car on the track. Waltrip going incredibly well with that horsepower he has, but even more significant to me, Jim, is that David Pearson, who has been two laps behind, is now only a lap and seven-eighths behind. In other words, he's ahead of Waltrip. If a yellow flag were to come out now, Pearson would be able to make up one whole lap of that two-lap deficit. So this is a very strategic part of the race. Yellow flag so important in stock car racing because the field bunches up. It begins, in effect, a new race for you. And Pearson must use those yellow flags carefully now to try to get back into the race, back on the lead lap. Meanwhile, there is the leader, Darrell Waltrip, the green and white car. Benny Parsons still chasing him in second place. Now here's the battle for third place. Buddy Baker trying to get past Terry Labonte on the inside. He does so, and now here comes number 21, Neil Bonnet. He is going to pass Labonte also. So now it is Buddy Baker in third place, Neil Bonnet in fourth place, Terry Labonte in fifth place, and back in sixth place, the blue and yellow car belongs to Dale Earnhardt. He is the man who is battling Cale Yarborough for leadership in the point standings and the one who will benefit the most if Yarborough is forced to stay out of the race for long. With Yarborough's car in the garage, here's Chris Economaki. This could be a tough break for Kale in the closing races of the season. As the Junior Johnson crew now goes to work on the car, there's the rear tire that is flattened out. They're going to try and get the car fixed and get Kale back in the race because points are paid all the way down. Back out on the track. It is still Darrell Waltrip in the lead. You see him there in the middle of that three-car shot. And right in front of him, the red car belongs to David Pearson. Now, Sam, it's very important for Pearson here to stay in front of Waltrip. Critical at this point, yeah? If Waltrip were to squeeze back by him and a yellow were to occur, this opportunity for David to pick up a lap would evaporate. So that is a little race within a race right there on your screen. Meanwhile, the sky above us has begun to threaten rather ominously. Large dark clouds have moved in overhead. We may be seeing some rain in the near future here at Darlington. So quite a drama is developing with Yarborough struggle in the garage area, Pearson trying to come back, Waltrip leading the race, and we'll be back. Back at the Southern 500, the leader is still car number 88, Darrell Waltrip, the man who led qualifying at nearly 154 miles per hour. In second place is the car to the far left of your screen, number 28, Buddy Baker. Third place, number two, Dale Earnhardt. But much of the drama centers around the red car, number one, David Pearson, who after some early difficulties has been picking his way back up through the field, getting ready to pass Earnhardt right now. Pearson, who has won 11 races, far more than anyone else over this Darlington Raceway, and Earlier, we asked him about his liking for the track and his ability to drive so well here at Darlington. Anytime I come here in Darlington, uh, I feel like I've got a chance of winning the race. Uh, if I can finish the race and don't have any problem with the car, and I'm around towards the end, uh, I feel like I can shoot for it and, you know, and I always got a chance of winning. I don't know why. I've always run good here, and uh, I guess maybe I just try a little bit harder than I do anywhere else. I don't know what it is, but uh, for some reason or another, I, I kind of like Darlington. Well, whatever it is, right now he is conducting a clinic for all the other drivers on how to handle the Darlington track, the one they call the Lady in Black. Trying to get past Buddy Baker on the inside. He's not going to make it. But if he can get past Buddy Baker, Pearson, who earlier in the race was two full laps behind, will be exactly one lap and one place behind the leader, Darrell Wolf. You know, Jim, one of the reasons Pearson, I think, goes so well on this track, aside from his actual driving ability, which is so incredible, is that these days he doesn't do a full schedule of Grand National stock car races. He only picks a few. He always picks this one, and it means an awful lot to him. I think he brings special energy to this particular event. Exactly right, Sam Posey. While it's the 23rd race of the season for Waltrip and Baker and most of the drivers, it's only the seventh race this season for the man they call the Silver Fox, David Pearson. Now coming off of turn number two, he may try to pass Buddy Baker. There he goes. He's going to try to take Baker on the inside on the back straightaway, and he's got it. So at this point, the next target for Pearson becomes to try to pass Darrell Waltrip. If he can do that, he will be precisely one lap behind. He will have already made up one of the two laps he lost earlier in the race. Pearson's speed here isn't just a function of horsepower, Jim. It's the speed that he's carrying off the turn. So it has a lot to do with the way he's driving. Look at that. 
Dale Earnhardt has just made the pass on Buddy Baker. That puts Earnhardt now up into second place. And look at this, Jody Ridley spinning out over in turn number three. That's car number 90 down on the apron, and he has already spun and is heading toward the pits. Ridley, the man who has Rookie of the Year honors, virtually locked up at this point. Now the caution flag will come out. We're looking at NASCAR control. And there is the yellow flag. So now they will bunch up once again. And the rain has begun to fall, incidentally. There are a few droplets falling around the track as you watch the leader, Darrell Waltrip, coming into the pit. Most of the other leaders will pit along with Waltrip, so the leaderboard will have been reshuffled when we come back. You're looking at car number two, Dale Earnhardt, who has taken the lead coming out of the pits under caution flag here at Darlington Raceway. The caution flag out now because heavy rain has begun to fall on the speedway and on the fans. You see fans covering themselves. This is NASCAR control where officials will determine what to do about the rain. Incidentally, while we're here in the southeast, we should take this opportunity to welcome a brand new ABC affiliate to the network. Welcome okay, to WSB-TV in Atlanta. Red flag. Red flag. Let's stop them here on the starfish. Everybody get off the radio. So there is the word, red flag. And they will temporarily halt the race at this point. Now you can see that the starter across the track has as of yet been unable to hear the instruction to put out the red flag. Look at how hard the wind is blowing that yellow flag. This is a very violent storm which has suddenly moved in at Darlington. As a matter of fact, it's already blown over one of our cameras. They are big and heavy and that's quite an indicator of how strong this wind is. But there is the red flag. The cars will be lined up on the front straight here at Darlington. The race will be halted at this point. We'll be back later. Back at Darlington Raceway, where there is racing again in the Southern 500. Jim Lampley, along with Sam Posey and Chris Economaki, you are looking at the leader, car number 88, Darrell Waltrip, the green and white car, who has resumed the lead. And right now, Waltrip is trying to get ready to lap Richard Petty, who is at the tail end of the lead lap. Petty, the king of the sport, who was competitive earlier in the day, but now is dropping back, and perhaps that neck injury is bothering him. The man in second place, quite a story. The red car, car number one, David Pearson. You remember us telling you that early in the race he was two laps down. And there is car number 11, Dale Yarbrough, who after missing 82 laps following that fire that you saw, is also back out on the track and racing. But Pearson has fought his way back up through the pack and now is on the lead lap in second place, as you can see, just a few car lengths behind the leader, Darrell Waltrip. What a performance by Pearson, Sam. Yep, this is the moment David's been waiting for the whole race, Jim, and of course it's the moment that Darrell Waltrip has feared because he's known, because of the radios these guys have in their cars, that uh, Pearson has been unlapping himself. Now it's a straight fight to the finish. Another yellow flag, apparently some debris on the track. They're going to clean the track off. Meanwhile, Richard Petty has pulled into the pits, and you can see there that Petty is getting out of his car. Joe Milliken, a second-year driver, will get into the car to drive relief for Richard Petty. But as Petty gets out of the car, let's go to Chris Economaki. He looks quite exhausted. He had a terrible accident at Pocono, suffered strained neck muscles, and you can see the neck brace that he's wearing. Helping him off with his helmet here. And there comes the neck brace off. And the harness that holds the helmet to the side of the car to relieve the strain on his neck is being unattached now. Cold rags being attached. Seven times a champion, and you can see the stress and the strain that this man has undergone on this brutally hot day here at Darlington, South Carolina. And you can see the pain he's experiencing as the sore rips from the Pocono crash, the bandages come off of that. Not a word has he said since he stepped out of that car. And there you see the champion seven times what he undergoes at the wheel of his racing stock car. Oxygen now for Richard Petty. This man has given so much to this sport, cold compresses on his wrists and on his head. And Richard Petty right now looks like a very, very old man. He had been running ninth, uh, higher than that earlier, and then he fell back. As any racing driver who's been in this position can tell you, you're just gasping for air now, hardly aware of what's going on around you. This hasn't happened to Richard very often in his long career, but curiously enough, it happened to him last year at Darlington. We're drawing toward a climax at Darlington, and the leader is still Darrell Waltrip in car number 88. In fact, 
Since David Pearson has moved up to challenge Waltrip, Waltrip has opened up the throttle and shown more horsepower than he'd shown us all day. He has extended the lead over Pearson. There you can see it on the screen, a wide margin between Waltrip in first place and Pearson in second. Uh-oh, there's Buddy Baker in car number 28. You see the smoke coming out from under Baker's car, and Baker, who has run among the leaders all day, may be done for. Interesting, Jim. They're not showing the yellow flag at this point, which means there's no oil on the racetrack. This very light smoke, to me, suggests what happened is, instead of blowing the bottom out of the engine, he probably just burned a piston or dropped a valve. There's the leader, Waltrip, putting another lap between himself and Cale Yarbrough, who's still out there plugging away. Now Waltrip seems to be slowing down, Sam. This is sudden and almost imperceptible, but you can see there that David Pearson is flying by him and into the lead. Must be something wrong with Darrell Waltrip's car. He has slowed down on the backstretch and will presumably begin pulling it toward the pits. And you, you can see, see the traffic going by. Him. Yeah, I think he's coasting here, Jim. I think he's done. I, I don't think the engine is running as we see that car. Well, that would make Pearson suddenly the leader in the race. So David Pearson has bided his time and waited back there behind Waltrip after getting in position to race with him. And suddenly now the leaderboard shows Pearson, Neil Bonnet in second place, Benny Parsons in third place, Harry Gant fourth. Waltrip pulls it into the pits. Wow, what a seesaw of development. I mean, it looked as if Pearson had overcome his disadvantage and was going to take the lead, but Waltrip fought him off, and just when he's establishing his supremacy, bang, something big went wrong. Does this look reparable, Sam? There's Neil Bonnet pulling into the pits. He's pitting on a green flag also. They did not put the yellow flag out there when Waltrip pulled in. So both Waltrip and Bonnet will be losing a lap. And now that means the race should be between Pearson, Parsons, and Harry Gant. With an obvious edge to Pearson at this point. Here's Waltrip's wife, Stevie. She's watching with some concern. And you know, Jim, really great self-control. It must be a bitter disappointment. This is the second year in the row she has seen her husband's car wheel back into the garage after leading much of the race. So Darrell Waltrip is beginning to look a bit snake bit at Darlington, much like this man, Richard Petty, who has not had great racing luck here. But now he looks physically all right anyway after having been so exhausted earlier. There's Cale Yarbrough Whoa. careening across the track on the Whoa. front straight and right into the guardrail. And after the long battle following the fire and so much time in the garage, Cale is finally done for. So with just a few laps left, the caution flag is out. They'll bunch up again. We should have a heck of a finish when we come back. You're looking at the setup for a blanket finish to a 500-mile race. When these cars come off of turn number four and down the front straight at Darlington. They will get a green flag with five laps to go in the Southern 500. So this is a battle for the lead between Benny Parsons in the blue and white car and David Pearson in the red car. Behind them, Dale Earnhardt in car number two is in third place. And just behind them, Neil Bonnet is moving into the fourth position. Now, Bonnet is one lap back. So he has now separated the three leaders from the rest of the field. Pearson, Earnhardt now has moved into second place. Benny Parsons in third. You saw a quick flash of flame under Earnhardt's car, number two in second place there, but he is still moving well. Yeah, these guys are starting to drive on parts of the track they haven't driven on all afternoon, Jim. You gotta remember that the form that we've seen, just four laps to go at this point, by the way, the form that we saw earlier in the day may not hold now. There goes Earnhardt. He's getting up inside Pearson. Look at that. That's very, very close stuff at this stage. David Earn Pearson came down in his line a little bit there to shut him off. That's very competitive driving. Here goes Earnhardt again. He's going to try to take David Pearson, and he has got him. Now here comes Pearson back inside. Turn number four, the most difficult part of the course, and he passes him back. Dynamite racing. Absolutely masterful by Pearson there, but also by Earnhardt. Notice how softly sprung Earnhardt's car is. His bottom here and there around the track. Very tense stuff, and as I say, the previous form of the race is no hint as to what'll happen here because these guys have just been in the pits. They've changed the cars one whole more time, and the cars are a little different now than they were earlier. Three car race to the finish, now two and a half laps to go as they go down the back straight at 170 miles an hour. Again, Pearson is able to hold off the challenge of Earnhardt inside. So it is still Pearson in first place, Earnhardt in second place, Benny Parsons third. And you know, Jim, the traditional stock car approach of hanging back uh, until the last lap and then slipstreaming by, that just doesn't apply here. The slipstream, the drafting doesn't work. These guys are going for it right now. In the turn, and now they're on the wall. Pearson is still going. Benny Parsons coming down onto the apron. Earnhardt is slowed down up onto the wall. The yellow flag will come out, but it's a race to the start-finish line from here. Whichever car gets there first will win the race. Pearson is still running in car number one. 
but he's slowing down. Forget about Bonnet on the left of the screen. He's a lap behind. The question is whether David Pearson can get there first out of the car behind him. Terry Labonte, 44. Oh, Labonte. I think it was Labonte. Do you? I can't tell. Almost impossible to tell. Terry Labonte in car number 44 was the other car on the lead lap as they came down the front straight. The question is whether he got there ahead of David Pearson. The yellow flag was out. The winner is whichever car got to that start-finish line first and got to the yellow flag first. And right now, I think we have to assume it's Terry Labonte. Yep, this is actually the last lap of the race, and it's being run under the yellow, which means that if Pearson was, in fact, behind at the line, he cannot come by, back past to take the lead. This is Labonte's race. Are they going to give the like flag? It. Yes, they are. Terry Labonte gets the checkered flag. He has not led at any point during the race. He only led for the last lap under the caution flag after just getting across the start-finish line ahead of David Pearson. And there is Labonte's pit crew going absolutely wild. This young man's only 23 years old. Here's another look at that finish. Okay, now you can see the, see the little smoke coming out of the back of Pearson's car. That's partly because the whole right side of his car, the side we can't see, has been damaged. The tires are rubbing badly. In fact, his whole toe in and alignment is not correct. That's why Labonte has his extra speed. They're only a few yards short of the finish. Pearson tries to pinch him off here, but Labonte is coming right down onto the pit apron to make the pass, and it's, you'll see it. You'll see the line on your screen. You'll yep. see the line. It's coming up on the left of your screen right here. And there, Labonte has gotten past Pearson, and there it is. Incredible. Margin of victory one week. Sam, I think all three leaders went into the wall on turn one on the next to the last lap. You can see the damage there to Pearson's car, not just cosmetic to the bumper, but it also uh, realigned the front suspension. That's why he was so slow coming toward the line. He couldn't do anything about it. There, the celebration has begun for Terry Labonte, 23-year-old second-year driver out of Texas, has moved to High Point, North Carolina to get into the heart of stock car country, his first Grand National Speedway win ever. And let's have another look at what happened in turn number one of the next to last lap. Well, you know, the funny thing is you got to figure with all three leaders just suddenly sliding out into the wall, it makes you wonder if there wasn't oil on the track. Now, I didn't see any. The officials didn't signal any, but all three of these guys, top guys, all just slid up into the wall suddenly. Great, great move by Neil Bonnet there as he squeezes his way through. Really brilliant but driving. But he wasn't on the lead lap. Neither no, was wasn't. number 15, Bobby Allison. There he is. There's Terry Labonte, number 44, who got through there cleanly and then remarkably had the presence of mind to recognize the need to race Pearson to the flag for the victory. Here's one more look at it. Now, Jim, it seems to me the possibility is if there was oil, and we have reports from crews in the pits that there was, perhaps the three guys who were gunning for the lead were running a higher groove than the, the next two guys behind them and got up into that oil, whereas Bonnet and Allison were just low enough to escape it. Then still a remarkable piece of driving by Labonte to react quickly, get down low, and come on to win the race. So the Terry Labonte victory celebration has moved into victory lane. Remarkably, he is the youngest man ever to win a NASCAR Grand National Super Speedway race. And there's the man that I think most people here expected to win it going into those last two laps. David Pearson, who won the Southern 500 a year ago, the Rebel 500 here this spring, this time came up with the wrong luck in the last two laps. And here he is, Terry Labonte, the youngster from Corpus Christi, Texas, who is really a surprise winner and missed lots of applause. Hey, congratulations, Terry. When did you know you had a one? Let's turn around and get a look at you here. When I beat Pearson across the line, I, I thought I had him, but uh, you know, the crew told me I did, but I wasn't sure. What happened over there in turn three, two of the last lap? I don't really know. Uh, you know, they got together and uh, and then Pearson was the only one running in front of me. I passed him. I, I saw his car was messed up, and I just ran as hard as I could, you know. And uh, I got mine right at the start. You, you know what this means, Terry? This win? No, not really. <laughs> I don't believe it. I mean, you're going to be on the winner's circle program the rest of this year, all next year, the big money to come and race. I think perhaps it's a turning point in your career. Your financial worries are over. I know it hasn't had a chance to settle in. How will you celebrate tonight? We're going to celebrate all week. <laughs> The official results, again, the surprise winner, Terry Labonte, Pearson second, Harry Gant third, Benny Parsons finished the race for fourth place, and Neil Bonnet fifth. And the NASCAR Grand National point standings at this point in the season show Dale Earnhardt lengthening his lead over Cale Yarborough, Petty third, Parsons fourth, Waltrip fifth. The circuit ends in November in California. Now, once again, a look at what is, in effect, 
the finish of the race, the race to the yellow flag with one lap to go. You know, Jim, seeing this one last time makes me realize that David Pearson, even though his car was crippled, had he wanted to, he probably could have won this race by forcing Labonte up against the pit wall. But with a great sense of fair play, he pretty much kept it in the middle of the racetrack and let Labonte make his move. Quite a tribute to Pearson, I think. And it was one of the most exciting NASCAR finishes ever. This is Jim Lampley for Sam Posey and Chris Economaki saying so long from Darlington. The executive producer of ABC Sports is Rune Arledge. The coordinating producer of ABC's Wide World of Sports is Dennis Lewin. The Southern 500 was produced by Michael Pearl, directed by Larry Cam. World Cycling Championship segment produced by Kurt Gowdy Jr. and Ken Wolfe. Studio segments directed by Norm Sammet. Studio coordinator is Carol Letty. Associate director in Darlington was Joel Fell. Technical directors Joe Schavo and Dave Fee. Stay tuned for NCAA football following immediately over most of these ABC stations, except on the West Coast. Today we feature regional coverage of Purdue versus Notre Dame, Virginia Tech at Wake Forest, and Southern Mississippi at Tulane. Travel arrangements made through and a promotional fee paid by United Airlines. United flies more people to Hawaii than any other airline. That's what friendly skies are all about. By the way, with regard to the crash involving the leaders on the next to the last lap, we have received word from NASCAR officials that some drivers reported spotting oil on the track in turn one when Frank Warren blew his engine on that lap. However, NASCAR spotters in turn one have reported no indication of any oil on the track.